Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing my January reading wrap-up. Look at this, we're pretty much on time. What's the date? It's the 3rd of February, so I'm not super behind. Anyway, here is the stack of books. I'm going to put them down now. Woo! And uh, we will begin at the beginning. So, book number one is... Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. This is obviously one of her most well-known books. And actually, the only reason I hadn't read this already is that I'd not seen it in a charity shop or anything like that. And that's where I usually uh, get my Agatha Christie books from. However, I did eventually get round to it. It's a pretty famous one, so I'm not going to go too much into it. It's kind of a locked room mystery almost. And um, it reminds me of um, a novel by Bram Stoker called Snowbound, where there's this like theatrical troupe and they, uh, they get stuck in the snow and tell each other stories to pass the time. And that's pretty much what happens here, except they get stuck in the snow and a murder has happened. And uh, yeah, I didn't like the ending very much. I predicted the ending, but I don't know whether I'd been spoiled for it or not. I'm not too sure. I gave it a four out of five and it's a, it is, you know, it's a, I, I can see why a lot of people love this one, but it's just, for me, it's not my favorite Christie. It's good, not great. Okay, then we have Motherhood by Helen Simpson, and I quite like this. This is one of the vintage mini modern books. Look at that, it's so pink it won't even pick it up on the camera. Basically, this is a bunch of short stories from collections called Dear George, Hey, Yeah, Right, Get a Life, and Constitutional. And I really like them, and I think the reason for that was because while I obviously can't relate to the state of being a mother or be being pregnant and having children and all of this kind of thing, this book kind of... It made me able to empathize with it and you, I found it quite easy to put myself in the characters places you know I'm not sure how much of it is uh, autobiographical uh, or not but uh, yeah I, I enjoyed it and I liked the way it showed sort of the darker side of being a mother as well um, and you know how sometimes she resented her kids basically and her sex life got destroyed and all this 3.5 out 5 for that then I read cards on the table by Agatha Christie and this one was I can't remember Oh, it's a Poirot one. Let me read you the blurb. Mr. Shaitana was famous as a flamboyant party host. Nevertheless, he was a man of whom everybody was a little afraid. So when he, when he boasted to Poirot that he considered murder an art form, the detective had some reservations about accepting a party invitation to view Shaitana's private collection. Indeed, what began as an absorbing evening of bridge was to turn into a more dangerous game altogether. So... Just picking it up, I couldn't remember it, but reading the blurb, I do now remember it. It's because I read it in like two days or something, so uh, I whizzed through. I'm also, because there, there was like a lot of talk about the bridge game, and I don't play bridge. I don't know anybody who plays bridge, but I don't know. It, it was like, it reminded me of, the, there was one of the Bond novels where there was like 20 pages devoted to a game of, bol uh, of golf, and I just, it wasn't for me really. But overall though, this was a pretty good mystery. I did enjoy it. I thought the characters were quite interesting as well. And this is almost uh, another one of those sort of locked room mysteries where you know there were only a certain number of people present, so you know it had to have been one of them, you know? So, uh, yeah, this one was a 3.5 out of 5 for me. Okay, then we have William Styron, Depression. So, again, another one of the uh, vintage mini-moderns. And um, so what's interesting about this, this, this is the author's own experiences with depression, but he didn't suffer from depression until quite an old age, until I think he was in his 60s. And so he writes about depression, but he also writes about, say, when he was in his 30s and he, somebody knew committed suicide, for example. And he's, he's able to talk about how he didn't understand it. And then, you know, later on, looking back as an older man when, who has suffered from depression and who... I can't remember whether he did try to take his own life, but he was definitely considering it. I mean, trigger warnings for all kinds of stuff in this one, you know, but... Um, yeah, really fascinating, and I mean, as someone who suffers from depression myself, I, you know, I appreciate what he had to say, and it's a 4 out of 5 again. Okay, then we have The Space Adventures of Kirk Sandblaster, Space Adventurer by Ollie Jacobs, and uh, I can link below, I reviewed this and another one that's coming up as part of Todd and Dane's Indie Read Along. But basically, it's humorous sci-fi, this is the first book in the series, so we meet Kirk Sandblaster and his two-headed alien friend Zla. And uh, my main issue with this one, I guess, was that it was told in a strange way in, in terms of it starts in the present and then like the, the narrative goes into the past as we discover how these characters met each other, you know? And so, I don't know, it was a little bit jarring for me uh, that book. I mean, again, this is the first book in the series and so I do also think it gets a lot better and it's still a 3.5 out of 5. 
Then we have Jeanette Winterson, Love, which, honestly, I don't even really remember this. Oh, I do remember this, actually. This was the... Yeah, this was the strange one where... This is, like, all self-reflection of her books, but I haven't read any of her books. So, it just came across as a bit sort of self-indulgent to me, I guess. Like, it just assumed that I'd read all of her books, and I, I haven't, so... Uh, three out of five I'm afraid like the others the others where I haven't read their books it works a lot better because it's presented as excerpts rather than criticism of the book if that makes sense anyway here we have Kirk Sandblaster plays the game of Loria by Ollie Jacobs so this is the second one that I read and reviewed for Todd and Danes indie read along basically the game of Loria is like a big battle royale and uh, Kirk Sandblaster decides to enter it because he's a space adventurer and that's what space adventurers do all sorts of shenanigans in shoe and uh, yeah this one was a four out of five this is probably one of my favorites of the series so far at least so there are five books in that series he's an indie author as well so you know go ahead and support him there are five books in that series in paperback and then I think there are two or three more available in Kindle but I don't read electronic copies so here we have Black Coffee by Charles Osborne slash Agatha Christie. So this is basically a Poirot novel based on a play that Christie wrote. I actually thought that um, Osborne did quite a good job. He's um, been her biographer and stuff as well, and he is a novelist in his own right. So it kind of, I think he, he makes sense as the person to do it. Whether it needed doing or not, I'm not particularly convinced. Especially because it's only about 170 odd pages. But um, it does feel like an Agatha Christie book, and it does give you some of that... You know, some of that classic Christie feels that um, that if, you, if you're kind of starting to run out of uh, Christie books to read, it's definitely one you should pick up. Don't just avoid it. Okay, then I moved on to the Penguin Little Black Classic. So this is Mrs. Rosie and the Priest by Giovanni, Giovanni Boccaccio. And bearing in mind, yeah, so, well, let me read you the blurb. It's perfect. Bawdy tales of pimps, cuckolds, lovers and clever women from the 14th century Florentine masterpiece, The Decameron. And uh, it is very bawdy, like, to the point where I was reading it and I was like, I can't believe he got away with this and didn't get lynched or whatever. But I suppose, you know, sexuality was fine to talk about then. And then, you know, we get the Victorians and it all goes a bit tits up. Sorry, I need a drink. I'm thirsty. I've got a cold, by the way. I also have vegan popcorn chicken bites. Um. God damn it! Stop sliding! <laughs> okay, next up we have Appointment with Death by Agatha Christie, and uh, Brian's Bookshelves recently reviewed this as well. So I will link to his review of it. I think I did one too, I don't know. All links below, etc. And uh, this is set in Petra, and basically, there's this horrible old woman, and everybody in her family hates her, and then suddenly she dies, and of course, Poirot is on hand, and uh, he investigates this death, basically. But my problem with it was that it was like 200 pages of setup before she gets murdered. And you know she's going to get murdered. And uh, and then when she does get murdered, it's just a bit of an anti-climax. And then it all, the ending all felt a bit rushed. And um, I know a lot of people really love this one, but it wasn't particularly for me. It was still alright. It was a 3.5 out of 5. I mean, I always say Christy at her worst is better than most at their best. So Okay, then we have Gerard Manley Hopkins as Kingfisher's Catch Fire. This is number 2 in the Penguin Mini Black Classics. Uh, the blurb here, considered unpublishable in his lifetime, the Victorian priest's groundbreaking experimental verse on nature's glory and despair. Unfortunately, it wasn't really my kind of poetry. I'm going to read you a bit because I think that's the best way for people to get a, a feel of whether they're going to like a poetry book or not. Um, but I'll give it my rating now. I think I'll, I'll give it a 2.5 out of 5. Pied Beauty. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple colour as a brinded cow. For rose moles in all stipple upon trout that swim. Fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches wings. Landscape plotted and pieced, fold, fallow and plough. And all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. 
All things counter, original, spare, strange. Whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how. With swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim. He fathers forth whose beauty is past change. Praise him. Okay, here we have the Future Workplace Experience by Gene C. Meister and Kevin J. Mulcahy. And uh, this is another one of those books that I read for uh, a client who I then write kind of spark notes summaries. So this one basically presents 10 rules that are going to help you to navigate the future of work, basically, which obviously with things like, you know, remote working and the gig economy and even stuff like artificial intelligence coming along and, and disrupting things is a bit uncertain to say the least. So these rules are kind of rules that you can follow that are loose enough that they'll still you'll still be able to use them in five to ten years while being sort of firm enough that they do actually provide some guidance, you know. So I, I thought this was one of the better ones that I've read for this client. I, I'll still only give it a 3.5 out of 5 because apparently that's my rating today. But um, yeah, I, I mean, if, if that's your sort of thing. All right, now here we have Anonymous, the saga of Gunlaug Serpent Tongue. So this is uh, Icelandic folklore. This is number three in the Penguin Little Black Classics. Ranging across Scandinavia, England and Ireland, a Viking Age epic of two poets in doomed pursuit of Helga the Fair. I think it's Icelandic. Yeah, it was written down in Iceland, although, you know, nobody knows, I guess. It's one of those things. And, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this. There was even this one bit which I particularly liked where there was a duel between these two people. And, basically, they took it in turn to strike each other. And so the first guy swung his sword and his sword smashed the other guy's sword and then a bit of it flew off and then nicked the first guy. And then the second, the first guy goes, I submit to you that you are defeated because you have no weapon. And then the other guy goes, well, I submit to you that you are defeated because my sword drew first blood. And I just thought that was quite interesting. So yeah, uh, four out of five for that. Would recommend. Here we have The Mirror Cracked from Side to Side by Agatha Christie. Uh, you can probably tell I was on a bit of a Christie hype this month. So uh, yeah, this was the one where it all, all surrounding this movie star. And then... Um, there's a big party basically and someone dies at this party and Miss Marple happens to live nearby. In fact, I think at the start of this book, Miss Marple has a little stumble and falls down and then she gets picked up by the person who eventually becomes a murder victim. And what's interesting in this one is that Marple talks about how she recognises people based on their behaviour, you know, and she's like, well, she's a lot like old so-and-so was 25 years ago. And so that's one of the ways that she sort of predicts what people are going to do. And I just thought that was really interesting. Uh, it, it wasn't the, the best Miss Marple, but I'll give that one a 3.75 out of 5, not quite a 4. Here we have Thomas De Quincey on murder considered as one of the fine arts, Penguin Little Black Classic number 4. The provocative early 19th century essayist casts a blackly comic eye over the aesthetics of murder through the ages. So this was alright, but it was a little bit dull. I also got a bit confused, because I'm not sure whether it was presented as De Quincey's original work, or whether he was literally just reporting on something, because it's kind of... At the beginning he says like he saw this at a, a meal or something like that, or a speech that was an after-dinner speech, and then it just goes into the book, and I'm like, well... So actually he didn't write it, he just wrote it down. I'm still a bit confused about that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like um, a look back at how murder has been used, mostly in literature to be honest, but also in real life uh, occasionally. Uh, I'm going to give it a 3 out of 5, it hasn't really stuck with me. Okay, then we have Mythed Connections by Michael G. Munns. So Michael G. Munns is, as far as I know, he's an indie author. We both used to be published by Book Trope back in the day. Uh, and uh, basically these are short stories that are kind of set in our world but with Greek gods um, so he has a novel out called Zeus is Dead and this actually has a an excerpt from it which I didn't bother rereading because I'd already I've already read Zeus is Dead but this it, it was just nice to go back into his he's definitely got a unique style of writing you know and you, you can tell when you're reading one of his books it's almost like uh, it's, it's like Rick Riordan meets Terry Pratchett I would say um, yeah, so, it, and, and somebody like, like, Jean Bookish Thoughts, if she's watching, I doubt she's watching my wrap-ups, but she'd like this, because she likes her classical mythology and stuff, and, uh, yeah, just humorous. Uh, so I'll give that a four out of five, and watch out for the, the first story in it is, uh, basically this guy discovers the underworld by accident and starts talking to, uh, the gatekeeper. Next up we have Friedrich Nietzsche, Aphorisms on Love and Hate, number five, and this says, The iconoclastic German philosopher's blazing maxims on revenge, false pity, and the drawbacks of marriage. Now, um, 
My Myers-Briggs type indicator uh, personality type is INTJ, which you either know what that is or you don't. I'm not going to go into it too much. But basically, the point is, is Nietzsche is meant to be a bit of an INTJ hero. I could see why, because of the way he thinks and whatnot. And um, definitely, I found myself nodding along at this. This is my first time reading Nietzsche. People have always told me I should. Never got around to it. Finally did, and I shall be reading some more. So, four out of five. Okay, then we have Charles Bukowski, The Absence of the Hero. This isn't Bukowski's best. Uh, this is most, in fact, it's, it is entirely prose. And the problem with it is, is that it's kind of a collection of his work throughout different years. But there's, it doesn't really seem to have like a driving theme behind it, you know? It just feels like random stuff that's been brought together. I mean, it's still enjoyable to read. I mean, I'm a huge Bukowski fan, even though I think the man himself was a bellend. But um, yeah, I, I, I did enjoy reading it. I just don't know why it is a thing, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's 3.5 out of 5. Probably not the best place to start with Bukowski, but if you're a seasoned Bukowski reader, why not pick it up, you know? All right, now we've got three more black classics back to back. So we have Traffic by John Ruskin. The radical Victorian art critic's excoriating defense of dignity and creativity in a world obsessed by money. Fairly forgettable, to be honest. I'm sorry to any Ruskin fans out there. I wouldn't say no to rereading him. It's just, I mean, I've read about 10 of these now. And after a while, you start to only really kind of care about the ones that really stand out, you know? So that one, I'll give it, I'll give it a three out of five. Uh, then I read Walt Whitman, On the Beach at Night Alone. The visionary 19th century American poet celebrates nature and the human spirit in these verses from Leaves of Grass. Now, I read Leaves of Grass, didn't enjoy it, didn't enjoy this either. I guess I'll read you some Whitman though. I mean, there's no denying he's a super influential poet, he's just, he's just not really for me. In fact, I was, okay, we'll read you this very first bit. Come said the muse, sing me a song no poet yet has chanted, sing me the universal. In this broad earth of ours, amid the measureless grossness and the slag, enclosed and safe within its central heart, nestles the seed perfection. By every life a share or more or less, non born but it is non born but it is born, concealed or unconcealed, the seed is waiting. Two out of five, sorry Whitman, just not my poet. And then we have Pu Song Ling Wailing Ghosts. These delightful miniature tales of macabre hauntings, monsters and magic tricks are classical China's greatest stories. And these were very good actually. These are almost, if you're, yeah, if you're a horror reader I think you should, uh, and especially if you're a horror writer, you should pick these up just to get a bit of grounding in like, it is almost like, it's like, uh, it's, it's like the Chinese Edgar Allan Poe or something like that I guess. Uh, four out of five for these, recommend. Okay, then I read three from this, so I've already read The Running Man. So I counted these as individual books instead, even though this is like part of the uh, the bind up. So this is the Backman books by Stephen King. And I read Rage, The Long Walk and Roadwork. I actually read the three of them in about four days as well. So Rage is King's only uh, like out of print novel. And basically it's because it's about a high school shooter and it was once found in a high school shooter's locker. So I think he felt a bit bad about it. It's more like almost like breakfast clubby. And what's interesting is this kid basically takes his class hostage and then after a while, they're almost no longer hostages, they're, but they all want to be there because they're all using it as an opportunity to finally spread, maybe not the truth, but their truth, you know? So I think that was like a 3.5 out of 5 for me. And we have The Long Walk, which basically it's 100 kids and have to just keep on walking, keep on walking. If they drop below a certain speed, they get a warning, three warnings, and they get shot. There can only be one winner. And so... Yeah, they have to walk, and I think have 450 miles, and this is over like seven days or whatever. No sleeping, just constant walking, and um, it's one of those stories that's really stuck with me. So when I first read it, I wrote my review straight after and gave it 4.5 out of 5, but since then it's definitely gone up to a 5 out of 5 for me, and I would definitely recommend it. And then we have road work, and that's basically about a guy who lives in a house and works in a laundry and this new road is going to be built and so they want to knock down both his house and his laundry and he sort of has a bit of a breakdown about it and uh, decides to to not move basically, loses his wife and has all sorts of adventures. It took me a while to begin with to get into that story but once I was in I was hooked and I did think he was I could relate to the character as well which, which is always a good sign. So I gave that one a 4 out of 5. 
Then we have Dune Messiah by Frank Herbert. So I read this with Mindy's Book Journey, Graham Quigley, Todd the Librarian, I think, Luke Ash from Totally Pretentious. A bunch of people, we all did it for January Take Two. Thank you to Mindy for organising that. I, I've been incorrectly credited in some people's videos. I, I created the first January last year, and then this year Mindy you know, asked if I was going to do it again, and I said, I wasn't planning on it, but if you do it, I'll join in. And now people keep saying like it's the, the, this this one is my read along. It's not. It's totally Mindy. So thank you, Mindy. And actually, I think I enjoyed this the most out of all the people who read it. I did read it as my bedtime book, which might have helped. So I only read like 25 pages a day. There is like a resurrection in this, which I always hate. I, I always feel like that devalues death. But I could overlook it because. I wasn't too bothered by it to be honest and there was a lot of intrigue and stuff the other guys in the group in the uh, group read have all kind of said that it feels like a like a filler novel between June and the third June which I can't remember children of June I think which I haven't read yet so I, I don't know about that but it definitely does feel it feels more to me like it should have just been another like it should have been bolted onto the first book rather than you know what I mean? Okay, and then we have A Modest Proposal by Jonathan Swift, number eight. Swift's ferocious landmark 18th century political satire on how to solve a famine in Ireland. So this was about how to solve the potato famine. His solution was for people to eat babies. Uh, so it's a good job it was political satire, but I actually, it, it was still funny. Like, it, that, that's the odd thing. It was, it was still funny to read and just the way he wrote and almost the deadpan delivery of it. So yeah, I would recommend this. I gave this a four out of five uh, again. Then here we have a Three Tang Dynasty Poets. This is another four out of five, believe it or not. Pastoral lyrical verse evoking the rural landscapes and peoples of 8th century China from three of its finest poets. So I'm going to read, I'm going to flip in at random. Who have we got here? This is, um, this is Li Po, remembering the East Rangers. Long since I turned to my East Rangers, how many times have their roses bloomed? Have their white clouds risen and vanished, and their bright moons set among strangers? But I shall now take Duke Shea's dancers with a sad song we shall leave the crowds and call on him and call on him in the East Rangers. Undo the gates, sweep back the white clouds. Let's do one here by Tu Fu. From a height. The winds cut, clouds are high, apes wail their sorrows. The eight is fresh, sand white, birds fly in circles. On all sides fallen leaves go rustling, rustling. While ceaseless river waves come rippling, rippling. Autumn's each faded mile seems like my journey To mount alone and ill to this balcony. Life's failures and regrets frosting my temples And wretched that I've had to give up drinking. Just bear in mind that was written in like 730 AD or whatever. I don't know, I, there's just something about it. I like the simplicity of the poetry as well. And a lot of people in the reviews for that have said um, that they think maybe something's missing from the translation or whatever, but I really like that sort of simplicity style, so I don't know. All right, and finally we have Bird Box by Josh Malaman, which everyone has heard of because of the Netflix uh, movie of it. So I picked this up because I wanted to read it before watching the movie, and I did. I actually watched the movie the day after I finished reading it, and uh, the two are definitely different. They kind of... It reminds me of like the Game of Thrones, how they just slowly make little changes and those little changes all come together to make big changes, you know. I thought the book was better, but I thought both were good and um, if you liked one, you'll probably like the other. However, if you've read one, you don't necessarily need to see it, I don't think. Like, if you've read it, I don't think you need to see it and if you've seen it, I don't think you need to read it. I'm sure that's blasphemy, but... Um, the other thing I had with this as well is, even though this is published by Harper Voyager, it just doesn't feel like very good quality. Like, And actually, I, I looked at the back, and I think it's printed by Lightning Source, who do a lot of uh, self-published books, so maybe that's why. But um, there was that. And then also, the uh, last part of it, all of this in my edition, is a bonus short story. But I didn't realise. So when the ending of the book came, it was just totally out of the blue for me, and I was expecting there to be another twist or maybe to find out more about what the uh, creatures out there were and uh, so I was kind of disappointed by that. I still gave this like a 4 out of 5 and the Netflix show is like a 3.75 out of 5. Do I need to say what this is about? It's about there are things out there and if you look at them you go mental. There we go. Alright. So there we have it. That is my wrap up for January 2019. Thanks as always for watching. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.